Well, hello, Elevate. Welcome to the uh, the best panel of the day, guaranteed, or your money back. Uh, I'm honored to moderate this panel with Tiffany Dockery and Jackie Bavaro. And we're going to be talking about your career as a product manager and your career progression as a product manager. We only have 30 minutes. This is going to fly by. And so let's just dive in. And we're going to start with some brief introductions. Uh, and so Jackie and Tiffany, if you could just kind of talk about how you got into product management and then maybe just like what you're up to these days. Uh, and then let's start with Tiffany. Cool. Well, hi, everyone. So glad you all could make it with us today. My name is Tiffany Dockery. I'm a product manager at Instagram now leading personalization for the Explore tab. Um, what got me into product management was I started out my career in tech and sales at Google. And every Friday at TGIF, we would hear about all the great innovations for the company. And I realized I wanted I didn't want to fund that innovation through you know revenue from ad sales, but I actually wanted to like be at the table solving the problems and coming up with those solutions. So I uh, went off to business school and then was one of the boatloads of MBAs that Amazon hires every year, which is my introduction to product management. Um, there I worked on a myriad of things from launching Amazon Fire TV and the retail or the demo software that runs on the demo device and stores to a third party marketplace for subscriptions. Uh, went to Spotify where I got into the personalization machine learning space. And uh, after a couple of years there, I moved over to Instagram. So happy to be with you all today. Hi, and I'm Jackie. I'm excited to be here as well. Um, I started product management um, as a PM intern at Microsoft. Uh, I was a computer science major and did two summers there before starting at Microsoft full time. Then I moved over to uh, the Google APM program where I got to work on Google search and some data, um, some API products. Uh, and then from there, I decided to uh, take a risk and go join a startup that one of my friends from Microsoft had been at. And I joined Asana as the first PM. And I got to be there for eight years, growing with the team, becoming head of product management, um, launching all kinds of things. And about a year ago, I left to focus, sorry, going back one step. While I was at Asana, I decided to write a book on um, uh, PM interviews. So I wrote Cracking, co-authored Cracking the PM, Cracking the PM interview. And right now I'm working on a second book called uh, Cracking the PM Career. So that's a little bit about me. Cool. And then uh, a little bit about myself. I actually got into product management by uh, selling uh, my startup to Airbnb. I was an engineer my entire life up until that point. And then when you get to a larger company, you kind of have to fit into a bucket. And PM happened to be the closest bucket to what I was doing in the startup. And so I moved from engineering into product management. And currently, uh, I spend my time writing a newsletter. I kind of, uh, yeah, that's kind of where my life has gone. Um, and so maybe on that topic, uh, a lot of people are, are trying to get into product management. It's kind of this very uh, trending topic of how do you become a PM? And so maybe as a first question, uh, can you guys talk about how you think people should try to get into PM? What you've seen is most successful in trying to get a PM role as, as a first time PM. Jackie, do you want to start? Um, I think uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to. Sorry. Um, so I think that this is this is a question that is uh, very close to my heart, because when I started out wanting to be a PM, I guess oh, more than 10 years ago, you know, it was even harder then because like, what is this role? And I'm really grateful to like the thought leadership of Jackie, because I was like a super helpful guide for me. But I also realized that it there's a lot of gatekeeping in product management. And so when people ask me this question, I first say that like, like product management is both a role and a skill set and you can embody the best way to get into it is to embody the skill set before you get the role and so what that often looks like is like find a problem and solve it and that one gives you something to talk about in your pm interviews which is where people often struggle but two it gives you a taste of like do i actually like this style of working do i like like not having actual authority over the people who i need to solve the problem do i like the navigating this ambiguity and so what i often tell people is if you're at a company that has product management as a role, like just seek out someone, have a coffee with them and state your interests explicitly and see if there are any problems that they think are important enough that it should be solved, but that they don't have the bandwidth to and see if they can give you a small slice of it to again, help them give you something to talk about and let you um, show that you have the ability to kind of flex into this this role. There's increasingly, I did, I did teach at, at the product school, General Assembly has product management courses. I, I went the very expensive route and got an MBA. I think that if that's what you feel called to do, feel free, but you don't need to get six figures of debt or it's been two years of your career to get into product management. You can easily uh, take one of those courses. And a lot of uh, my 
former students were were very successful in using that to one show proof of interest because everyone wants to be a PM but no one knows what it is. Learn the language of product management, and then also part of oftentimes those courses will have you compete some um, complete some small project to kind of show you know to take you through the product development life cycle in some small part. The last thing that I think is often overlooked increasingly is hackathons. Like I went to hackathons after I was a PM, but I, I still have a soft spot in my heart for hackathons because I think it is like the rawest place to really understand like the art of product management. Nice. Yeah, I entirely agree with all of that. Um, I think that the, like you said, I think the, uh, one of the best ways to become a product manager is, is sort of the internal transfer route. So you are at your job and you start doing some product management type skills. You offer to help out a PM or maybe your company doesn't have any. And then after a little while, you can ask for that official title and now you're a PM. Um, uh, another thing, though, as uh, Tiffany mentioned, is there is uh, there is gatekeeping in um, in product management, and a lot of the bigger companies have sort of strict rules on who they'll allow to become a product manager. So another path that I've seen people take quite successfully is if you are at one of these big companies that does have a really established uh, product management role, um, use your time at that big company to learn as much as you can about how they do product management, um, absorb their best practices as much as you can. And then consider joining a smaller company, one that uh, doesn't have quite as many strict rules, maybe a fast growing startup, um, a company like that, that will be willing to take a risk on you and that will really appreciate that you've seen how product management is done at a big company. And the last one cool. we should have forget, Jackie, oh, yeah. is the APM uh, cool. route. So in Facebook and Instagram have a rotational product manager program. Google has APM program. So that's another pathway for folks looking to transition in. To pull on this thread a little bit more, you, you both, uh, Kind of pointed out that the best route into product management is at an existing company transitioning from a different role do you have any advice or just or, or i guess examples of when a company is just like i don't we don't have any places for junior pms yet and sorry just kind of wait and see where it, either it pays off or that somebody did something where they can kind of get over that hump and still find a role at a company that's just not ready for a new junior pm or is it just um, perseverance? I've seen the opposite. I've seen people who spent a really long time trying to transfer into PM at Google in particular, um, mm -hmm. and then decided like, wait a second, there are lots of companies out there that would love to have me as a PM, um, and then and then had excellent uh, product management careers from there. Yeah, and I, I, I will say that the few, I, I don't know about junior, I think that's a little, that word is loaded, but I think that oftentimes when you prove your value, even without the role, people are more willing to do something like make a role change. I think to Jackie's point, it's harder at a bigger company because it's not like a hiring manager who's making decision. It's a, there are bands and like, there's much more like actually internal logistics. So I, I do think at bigger companies, like not for any fault of your own, it's gonna be difficult. But I have found that like even mid-sized or smaller companies, I think Spotify was a great example where a lot of people got into product management, mostly just again, by solving a problem and then getting advocates internally to like when a role opened up, even if they were more junior, they, they were a known entity, they had proven their value and what a hiring manager often wants is someone to fill that seat so they can get going. And so that's, that's the perseverance is important, but also making sure you um, network and, and state your claim along the way that this is what you want. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so you've got the PM gig now. Is there, is there a thing or two that you uh, wish you knew as a new product manager that you would go back and tell your younger uh, PM self that you want to share uh, and maybe we start with Jackie this time. Yeah, so my first product management job I worked on um, software that shipped on a DVD every three years and um, What I wish I could go back and say even though I love that team and I learned so much there I think I could have learned a lot faster if I was on a team that shipped much more frequently um, because the uh, the shipping life cycle the product life cycle is sort of the cadence with which you get to learn and reflect and then iterate and grow from there and so if you can, if you have a choice between two teams, choosing the one where you could ship more frequently, I think will give you a chance to learn faster. Definitely. I think um, for me, and I think this is true, particularly for folks who kind of go the MBA route, but I think anyone who comes from like a more kind of traditional, like hierarchical role or background, like it's okay to say you don't know. I think sometimes product management, product managers are framed as like, you know, you, you're a mini CEO and you have all the answers. and I actually think the biggest mistakes I made early on was not was being afraid to say I don't know. And what I don't know does it, it one creates trust with your team that you're like being upfront, <laughs> but two it also opens up space for other people to help. 
And I think often I, I see often junior PMs like they're very afraid of like not knowing. And in fact, like not knowing is a gift because it again allows people to help you and it creates space for your team to like for everyone to create a novel solution rather than you know you kind of dictating here's what we're going to do. So I I do think it's important for folks to like not be afraid of I don't know and to again understand like product management is a skill set and like you don't have to be the only person to help come up with a solution or even identify a problem on the team. The other thing I'll add is so much of your success as a product manager I find is just the impact that you drive. And so finding opportunities to drive impact ends up being really important. And a lot of times newer PMs are put on projects that aren't that impactful or aren't even like that good of an idea. And then people look at them and they're just like, what have you done in the past year? Nothing's, you haven't driven any impact to the business. And so one thing I've learned is to kind of be very thoughtful about that. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of for new PMs just getting started. Then uh, as you, maybe you're in PM for a couple of years, is there anything uh, you would suggest that maybe one or two years in product managers should be focusing on to kind of accelerate their career and level up? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. So um, when I was a new PM, I would look at the more senior PMs and I, I didn't understand what they did. Um, and I sometimes would get a little bit like, why are they higher level than me? Like I can do anything that they're doing. Um, and what I realized later on is that there was an entire part of their job that I just didn't even see. I would I had been really focused on shipping features and how you how you build it once you know what you're going to build how you build it, um, but as you move into like um, what's usually called the senior PM role but might have different titles at different companies, um, really you need to shift into doing more strategy work more strategic planning, and a lot of times PMs will hear you need to be more strategic and people are like what in the world does that mean so um, the way that I think about it is I think that a strategy I like to think about a strategy as having three parts. So the first part, um, and not everybody treats strategy the same way, but I've noticed that if you get all three parts, everybody who says you need to be more strategic is thinking of at least one of these. Mm. Um, so the first one is the vision. And that's this idea of, let me paint you a picture of how wonderful the world could be two years from now, um, once we've improved our product and really changed the world. So this uh, a lot of times sounds like an infomercial. You're like, things are so bad today. But in the future, you know, your coffee machine will know exactly how much caffeine you make and you need and your uh, your refrigerator will automatically order you the groceries and you sort of get into like, yeah, are you all on board with me? Do you all want to live in this future? So that's your vision. Um, the next part is the framework. So this is sort of um, the principles and the guidelines that are that are behind your vision. These are the reasons why your vision isn't just some wild idea you thought of in the shower, but that it actually makes logical sense because you have a few bets that you're gonna make um, and a few trade-offs you're gonna take and a few um, a few things that you believe about how to be successful that aren't exactly the same as what anybody else in your shoes would do. Um, so that might be saying that you really are betting on the future of um, embedded RFID codes or that you're, um, I love the example that um, Slack talks about how important it is to remove every little frustration that a person might have um, because that will block adoption. So really um, laying out your principles is the framework. That's the second part. And then the third part is the roadmap. So that's saying, okay, you know where we want to go. Here's how we're going to get there. Uh, next quarter, we're going to build this part. The quarter after that, we're going to build this. Then we're going to work to this. Then we're going to work to this. Um, and that roadmap is not a commitment. It's not like we're definitely going to do this and not change our, our plan at all. In fact, every part of this could be changed as you go along. But that roadmap lets you uh, lets you get a reality check on how fast you have to move and how much time will this really take? Is it going to take 20 years to achieve your vision or could it happen in two? Um, and that lets you um, adjust your plans to make sure that you're doing something realistic and it lets everybody around you start planning and betting on you. Um, and that's what you're gonna need to be able to say, okay, my team is three people now, we need to move to a team of eight people if we wanna achieve this. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the three parts of the strategy. And then the uh, the two tips I have on top of that is, um, first of all, is that you have to make time for strategy. Um, one of the top things I hear is people say, uh, well, my engineering team needs me every single day. I, um, I, can't take a, I can't take a break to work on strategy because I'm, uh, you know, everything would fall apart if I stopped. Um, and the way that I like to think about this is imagine, pre-COVID at least, imagine your friend was getting married and they said, hey, can you take Friday off to come visit, to come to my wedding? Um, almost everybody I know would do that, and um, and they wouldn't worry about their team falling apart on the day they were out of the office. 
So I think um, if you are willing to take one day out of the office um, or at home, just turn off your notifications. Uh, you don't even have to take a vacation day because you're doing real work. Um, and just take that day and, um, and that goes to part two, which is just take a stab at the strategy. Just try, write something down because um, once you have something written down, even if it's terrible, you can start to get feedback on it. And that's where you'll be able to start building on it rather than having nothing at all uh, where nobody knows how to coach you on it. So that's sort of my, my uh, mid-career PM advice. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think Jackie covered all the bases. The things that I would add are on the point of like making time for strategic work. Like I actually think that like the best PMs I've, I've, I've seen, and I, I feel like I've had a lot of success with this on my teams as well, is just build that into the culture of your team. Like Spotify was a very like, is a, the culture was very engineering oriented. I, I did have, I was embedded with the team and so we spent a lot of time together. And so we just, Wednesdays were our no meeting days. And like, it, and, and everyone kind of felt this bit of relief because it was like, okay, no meetings. We can actually like do heads down work. That's something that's codified into the culture at Facebook and Instagram, which I've appreciated because, and, and you as a PM really need to model leadership and take that time so that other people on your team feel empowered to take that time. And, and what you'll find is that like, it actually will up level the quality of work and also the thinking on the team as a whole and for you in particular. I think the other thing that Jackie touched on that I would just um, double click on, even though no one double clicks on the modern web, is, is, <laughs> um, is, uh, is this notion of thinking about starting. And I, I think that the, the one place where I see junior PMs really fall down is that they'll have an idea, they'll say, what about this? Someone will say no, and they'll be like, okay, I guess not a good idea. And then someone else will inevitably have that idea and then really be persistent about it. And then so much of your careers at companies is timing, right? And so, I, you know, we often at Spotify, we would talk about uh, Discover Weekly, like this, like, you know, Daniel Eck has talked about, he was not a fan of it. He was like, this makes no sense. Like no one cares about like a, a playlist of new music. And, you know, he, he admitted that he was wrong because the PM who started it um, just was so persistent, kind of got a little bit of time from engineers, built out the idea, tested it and ended up being so successful. Similarly, even in my time at Instagram, you know, I think we, there was this idea for like, how do we do more with like the save feature? And people were like, ah, there's, there's no future in it. And we were through timing able to actually get something out. And so I, I really do think that like, once you've got, once you know how to be a product manager, the next step is you've got to sell in the idea and you've got to have conviction sometimes and get a little scrappy to make it happen so that you can improve the value because oftentimes, particularly at big companies, people won't give you permission because there's always something more important to happen. And so you've really got to uh, not be afraid to take, take the initiative and, and really um, be persistent yourself. Amazing. Okay. So, okay, so now we're like a few years into the PM career trajectory and you're an amazing ICPM. What have you two seen as the kind of the trajectories of product managers as they get more and more senior and move through their career? And then if you have any thoughts on like, which is the best path for certain type of people, if you have any suggestions there, that'd be awesome. And maybe you'll start with Jackie. Uh, I think Tiffany, you've got you Tiffany? Got to okay. um, I think for me, you know, I, I think that the primary paths are like you either you get to a certain point and you you can't yourself do the work on your own and so you often will get into a management position um that was my experience at spotify like we went from a very small team to a very large team and i was yeah, put into a management position and what I, I think the mistake people often make is that like when you love being a product manager it is hard to be a manager because you a manager of other pms because you really do have to let go and so i i had to kind of look myself in the eyes and say like if you're going to do this you've got to be ready to, especially if I felt so passionate about the vision. It was something that I had like gotten buy-in for and I was so afraid of letting go, but I realized that like for me to be a good one, I hated managers who were micromanagers. I think most PMs do not, most people don't like being micromanaged. And I think micromanagement happens because people either like don't want to let go of like their ICPM, um, the energizing effect of being an ICPM. And you really do to like empower your team and give them the space to grow and learn. Um, and then I think, you know, when I switched over to Instagram, I went back to being a senior ICPM. And I think the, you know, it's very similar in that like my scope was similar to actually what I had at Spotify, but when you don't have a team of PMs, you know, it's very, you really gotta, or I've had to level up in my peer influence because, you know, to get things done at the at Explorer is a very large tab. I really had to form strong relationships across the company, understand what other people's priorities are. And I think that the senior IC route is really for people who like, they like they love the like nuts and bolts of being a PM and they don't want to give it up. And I think uh, where people really sh where people really shine as managers, they like they love it, but they also they 
I, this is what I found as well. They love the teaching part of it. That like the doing is great, but really the high that they get off on is like the, the teaching and seeing other people really level up in their own skill set as a PM. So I think those are the primary routes. And I think you've got to decide for yourself what energizes you professionally. And from there, make your intentions known both to yourself and also if you're at a company where you want to grow into that next position um, to your manager and you know, other folks in your leadership chain. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and definitely I see uh, I see that trend where a lot of PMs think that people management is the only route, um, but it's not. And, uh, and one of the things that sort of surprised me is um, how quickly uh, salaries in the PM career grow. So, um, so I know that when I was a brand new PM, I, I sort of was like, okay, well, I've got to become a VP of product or I'll never be able to support a family. And by about six years into product management, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, I, if I had realized how quickly these salaries grow, I would have I had a much broader sense of where I could take my career. Um, because because I would have seen that it, it's not really about about getting promotions until you're incredibly high level before you can um, mm -hmm. before you can make a great salary. So um, so you can take a look at levels at FYI if you want to see like sort of what the salaries actually are at some of these big companies. Um, but then once you once you've opened up your mind that it's that getting promoted as fast as you can isn't the only path. Um, there are a lot of interesting paths I see PMs take. Um, the first one I think is thinking about different kinds of impact you want to have as a PM. So um, so I see sometimes people at a smaller company want to impact more people, so they'll go to a larger company. Or people at a larger company want to have a more mission-driven impact, so they'll go to a smaller company that's working on a, on a, a mission that they really care about. Um, so that's one of them. I think people will also choose to switch companies because of the, uh, the type of work that they like to do and the type of team that they really want to be on. Um, and then beyond PM, uh, there's a, a bunch of different routes people take. Some people decide to go into venture capital, which mm. uh, gives you exposure to a very, very wide range of companies. And there's there's a lot of different roles in venture capital. There's entrepreneur in residence, where you're sort of preparing to start your own company. Um, and then there's various like um, associate routes. Um, it's very hard to become a partner track as a as a product manager, or sorry, as anybody in a venture capital. Um, but those are also other paths. Those tend to be very much with people who are okay with not being hands-on and like to take a more portfolio approach. Um, related to that, I see a lot of PMs, once they got into that level where their salary is really high, is taking the angel investing route. Um, Lenny, you can, I can give you some of that so you can talk more about that. <laughs> uh, and, then, um, and then also uh, paths like general management. So that's moving from focusing purely on the product to everything else in the business that it takes to mm -hmm. make a product successful. So how do you get the sales right, the marketing right, the partnership right? And that's that really is, people talk about mini CEO. A general manager is much more like a mini CEO than a, than a PM is. And general manager is really responsible for the success of that business. Mm -hmm. um, and then another path that I see a lot of people going into is uh, coaching and consulting later on in their careers. Um, especially I see it as a, as a lower stress way to leverage your PM skills. Awesome. Uh, the GM route is something I've also seen more and more in product management. Uh, I think people are still are still trying to figure out what the hell a product manager is, and a GM is like one solution to that problem where you're just in charge of it all. So it's going to be interesting to see that trend. Okay, so we're going to move into Q and A. We have five minutes for Q and A, and the most the highest rated question right now is, what is the single most important skill that a PM should have? What do you guys think? What do you think? I would just say prioritization, like the like most. Like the resource you don't have that's not replenishable is your team's time, and so you've really got to like be good at prioritization above all else. Yeah, I love that. I was I was gonna um, say something very related, which was thinking about the goals. Always double checking that whatever you're doing, does it? What do you? What is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? And are the things that you're choosing to do matching up with what you're trying to achieve? The one that always always comes to mind for me is communication. When I think about engineers, they code, and designers design. And like, what do PMs do? They mostly communicate. They write documents. They do presentations. They talk to people. They have meetings. And so, getting really good at communication, I find, is so so important. It makes everything else easier. So it's kind of a meta meta answer. Uh, okay. Second most highest rated question: What are some reflections slash things to consider when exploring IC role, like a principal PM that you two talked about versus uh, a lead or a people manager? Mm, uh, I think the biggest one is really that like there is like 
there are more and more senior IC roles, but I think there's just far more like, like there is a, I mean, this is what I'm navigating right now. They're like, you know, if I don't want to work at a big tech company, there are fewer senior IC roles at startups. And so like, you really got to decide like, like, again, what are you doing this for? Like for me, the scale of Instagram, like being able to work on personalization for something of this size was worth going back to being IC for me. But I think, I do think that like, um, in terms of your options, both in terms of salary and just available roles, like there are far more manager roles um, for PMs and there are like senior IC roles, particularly if you don't like working at big tech companies, I, I tend to tend towards them. So it's fine for me. But if you're someone who like acts likes a smaller company, it, it will be harder to find a senior IC role. Or senior senior. I mean, you'll definitely find senior PMs. But if you want to be like a principal or director level, but you don't have a team, that will be hard. Cool. OK, so the next question might be our last question, depending on how it goes. And it's an interesting one. How do you build others' confidence in you as a PM or your own confidence in yourself as a product manager? Um, yeah, I can start. So um, so I think a lot of a lot. my favorite piece of advice I got early in my career was uh, become the expert. Um, and before I heard that, I sort of thought that my job was to take two people who really knew what they were doing and just kind of connect them to each other. And so I was, I was just like, oh, talk to this person for that and talk to this person for that. Um, but when I heard that, I was like, oh, wait a second. Like, nobody else at this company cares about my, my part of the product as much as I do. Nobody else is going to take the time to really investigate it, research it, learn, talk to customers, um, mm -hmm. like get direct firsthand knowledge from lots of customers um, and really know this better than anyone else. Um, and once I realized that no one else wanted to do this, nobody else wanted to be the expert in my area and that I had the ability to do it, then um, that's what sort of gave me my confidence is I knew that I had thought about this longer than anyone else. I knew I had um, talked to more customers in this area, explored more different paths. Um, and that let, really let me believe that what I had to say was worthwhile and that I was bringing new information to other people who had focused on other parts of the product. Um, the other thing I would say here is that it does take time. Um, and it's, it's the first time it's easy to know that it's gonna take time, but when you switch companies, you are used to everybody trusting you and believing in you. And all of a sudden you get questioned again and people don't listen to you and it feels awful. Um, but just remembering that it takes time to rebuild that credibility and that it's okay that you have to explain yourself more and bring more data and spend a little more time backing up your points um, and that you will regain that credibility. Yeah, I think Jackie covered it 100%. Cool. I agree with all of that. One thing that I also found very valuable as a as a as kind of a early PM and all general PM is not letting things drop and kind of building this uh, a halo effect of if Lenny's got something on his plate, he's not going to drop it. He's not going to forget it. He's going to follow up with whatever you asked him about. He's going to get this thing done, or he'll tell you that he can't. And if you can keep delivering on that, I find that people build a lot of confidence. That, okay, I'm going to put it on a slate and it's going to get done. Um, yeah. Cool. I think we're out of time. So I think we might disappear now. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tiffany thank you. and Jackie, for this joining us for this panel.